Hi, I'm Aaron Reedy from Data Classroom, and today I'm going to show you how to use a data set with your students, how to have them work through an activity. And I'm going to be using the Elodia Photosynthesis Lab as an example data set. Now, this is a classic middle school life science lab. I also think you could use a version of this in a, in a biology class in high school, um, but um, the focus is, is the way we've written it here is for uh, middle school life science. Now, this is a great lab if you're wanting to eventually have your students conduct their own investigations of, of photosynthesis. I think this can give you a lot of ideas for manipulating variables, measuring them, collecting data. Uh, I think it's good practice for uh, thinking about plausible hypotheses related to the rate of, of photosynthesis. Um, and uh, I just think it's a great lab. It's one that I've done before with, with students. So uh, today I'm going to show you how to share this with a class and then work through it as a student. So first I'm going to navigate to the data set. So I'm going to go up here to the Browse tab and you see the red circle where I'm clicking up on the purple bar. I'm going to go to Data Sets. So I click Data Sets. And in here uh, I'm going to search. I'm going to search for Elodia. This is the only data set that comes up. I'm going to click on it to open it. And here we are in the in the data table view. Now, one, one thing I want to show you, you see this button up here in the corner that says save as, right? So you're working with a data classroom copy of this data set right now. But the minute you hit save as, you can make your own version of this. So we'll call this, uh, you know, Elodio Photosynthesis Lab. Mr. Reedy version, you can call yours, whatever you like. And I click save. And now I own this data set. So I'm no longer working with this publicly available copy, but I'm working with my own version. And then, you know, as a teacher, I can change the assignment. I can change the questions. I can even change the data. I can add more data. I can do anything I want to it now. Um, and I can change, you know, things in the table view, the graph view, or the assignment tab there, which is an attachment. Um, so if I want to share my own version of this data set with my students, I come over here to the hamburger man menu upper left. You see where my red circle is. And the one, two, third option down, one, two, three options down, share. And I click that and I can choose one of my classes out of here. And it, this will show me all of my classes that I've integrated with my learning management system. So for example, if I'm using Schoology to do my rostering, these will be my Schoology classes. Um, I can I can pick a, 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 a class there and then I can click share a copy and we'll make a copy and share that with, with the students. And we'll, I will not share my original. Um, I can also do anyone with a link can view. And this, this is sort of a Google Drive style link sharing, or I can even do anyone with a link can edit if I want everyone to become full collaborators on that data set and, and actually be able to make changes. So that's how you share it with students. Now, now we're going to go into what a student would do with this when they open it up right here. And if, if you gave them a link, they will come in directly to this data set. So they'll, they'll come in right here and what you will want them to do is navigate over to the assignment tab right here and look at the assignment for this this data set um this is this is the elodia photosynthesis lab and you can see this is a google doc that has been embedded in as part of the data set and it's what we call an attachment um you can do this yourself so if you make something in in a google doc and you want to bring it in here you can absolutely do that um, by adding an attachment here and it will appear in the data set like this so there's five activity questions you'll also notice that there's a warm-up activity it's a short youtube video um, where students are going to just watch this and think about what do they notice from this video what are the things causing the bubbles to form why do you think that? And I, I, they can click this link and it open it up. I've already opened it in another tab. So if I go up here and I'll just, just play a little bit of this video so we can see it and I'll discuss it here. But you can see there is a, a stem of Elodia. It's a common aquatic uh, plant that you sold at, at pet stores uh, for use in, a, in aquariums. Um, and you can, you can see here that it is, uh, they're fluctuating the light. And the camera is really set up so that you can clearly see the bubbles forming here that the plant is producing. And so, you know, what, what a student is going to notice in this case is that whenever the lights come on, 
the plant starts producing bubbles. And I, I believe this footage has been sped up just a little bit to make it more, more obvious. Uh, and when the, the light turns off, the bubbles stop. Um, or, or when the light is dimmed, the bubbles slow down. And so you can, you can see there's, there's a relationship between light and photosynthesis and the intensity of light and the rate of photosynthesis. And that's exactly what students are going to be exploring through this, through this data set. So you have them watch that as a, as a warm up activity. Now here, if I want to actually comment on that as a student and i want to write something in this and i'll we'll go down to question number one so there's there's a little bit of background not a ton of reading but just sort of the least you need to know there's a description of the data set and the procedure and, and what what we've done here is there are five different distance treatments for the distance of the light source so you have uh, a cutting of elodia in a beaker of water and you have a desktop lamp as a, as a light source and you've turned off all the other lights in the classroom and you, you try doing observations with the light 10 centimeters from the beaker, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters, 50 centimeters away from the beaker. And, and these five different distances we're referring to as distance treatments. And this we're considering them as a categorical variable, which is, so we're looking at the effect of treatment. You could also code this this variable as a numeric and, and look at the the effect of the distance. You you probably would want to do that if you didn't have fixed distances, but you you were asking students to do it from a variety of distances that weren't at these nice ten centimeter uh, increments. Uh, other variables we've also recorded is which student lab group uh, recorded the data, and so this is this comes from a class that had five different lab groups, uh, and then. Our response variable or dependent variable here is the number of oxygen bubbles. This is the number of bubbles observed during the two minute observation period. So we go down to this activity and there is um, make a, the first thing access asks us to do is make a graph that shows number of oxygen bubbles on the Y axis and distance treatment on the X. And then it wants us to add descriptive stats on the right to show the mean, excuse me, the mean and standard deviation for each treatment on our graph. Um, and then it's going to ask us to take that graph and paste it right here into the answer sheet. Now, to make changes to this answer sheet, I'm going to need to come over here and click edit. And when a student goes to click edit, it's going to first ask them if, to save the data set because they need to save their own copy so they can edit it because this is the teacher copy that I gave to all the students, but they don't have the power to edit that. So I save a copy and then when I click yes, edit this attachment, it's going to create a new Google doc in the data classroom, Google drive, and your student will be the only person who has permission to edit that document. And so now I'm the student, I've done that. And you see it's opening uh, a Google, a Google doc. Um, and I can, I can make changes to this and this will be reflected back in my data set on data classroom. So you can see the video. And again, they can click this to, um, you know, get that link to get that link to play right here, uh, within their doc. Uh, but we've already done that. So I'm going to go down to the first, uh, activity question here and bear with me one second. I'm just going to pull my shades because the sunlight is doing some crazy, crazy things there. Okay. So, um, here we've come, come down to the activity and we want to make a graph that shows oxygen bubbles on, uh, on Y and distance treatment on X. And then we want to paste that here. So let me go back to data classroom and to do this, we want to move over to the graph tab. This is the middle tab up here. And I'm going to, I'm going to first add number of oxygen bubbles. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to first add uh, distance treatment. And if we do it in that order, it's just going to be pretty automatic. And so we can see all the data points collected at each distance treatment. We can see how many oxygen bubbles by the height of the points. Now, I want to show you like a common, you know, something your students might have done that would have made this, you know, give them a moment of, OK, what do I do now? Right. So I'm going to undo this and say that they show distance treatment first well they'll, they'll they'll get a graph that you know this this might look very unfamiliar to them and then 
you know, maybe I want to add number of oxygen bubbles and it'll say, okay, if plotting categorical versus numeric, the categorical variable must be the X. Well, okay. I didn't, I didn't do that. So how do I fix it? If you go over here to the control panel at the right, you can see the red indicators show you what's currently on X and what's currently on Y. And if I want to flip it, like say, I want to put distance treatment on X, I just click X there and it will flip it around. And then it, and then it makes this graph. So in, in this way, your students can, can get to the graph, even if they don't happen to do it in the, you know, the right order, uh, first off, they'll, they'll be able to get there. So now if you remember the, the activity it asked us to add descriptive stats. So over here, the control panel starts giving us options. Um, and here's descriptive stats. When I click that, it's now showing me the mean and standard deviation. It also produced this, this table. I'm just going to move my face for a second. Uh, but this table on the right where you can see each, each distance treatment, uh, what is the mean standard deviation and some of those other descriptive statistics were outputted there. You know, if I wanted to just show the means, I can do things like hide the dots this checkbox over here, and it will just give me the means. Um, I can I can play around with this quite a bit. If I go in the appearance menu, I can make this show as bars. I can make this show as other symbols. But I think this default graph is, is pretty adequate for your purposes here. And, and the nice thing about showing the raw points is students are able to see the relationship between the spread of the dots and where the average is. So these blue dots with the error bars above and below they're showing you where the average is for each group there. And that that's probably, you know, a pretty relevant um, metric that you want them to compare the average between each of these groups. And you'll notice that, you know, the, these there's a pretty clear signal in the effect of distance treatment on the number of bubbles produced. But there the data is a little bit overlapping, right? Some of the values in this 20 centimeter treatment, the lowest value is equivalent to the highest value in the 30 centimeter treatment. So there's there's some overlap um, in these. And this, this you know, sort of emphasizes why in science you take multiple replicates, right? Why you frequently um, do more than one, one trial. Um, if we wanted to uh, play around with the jitter, that's the horizontal spread of the points, we can we can do that with these this plus and minus. So you can see if I go to, to no jitter, um, what we see is there's zero spread of the points. So some of the dots are stacked on top of each other. And that's in fact why a jitter dot plot um, gives you a jitter like that to, to make it a little bit easier to see uh, each of the points. So it's, it sort of spreads them out and you can just shuffle that with, by clicking this new random jitter button and it will, it will uh, move those around just a bit. So this, this might not be, the type of graph that you're used to starting out with your students. But I will say that the research on how young learners understand concepts like variation, um, it points to this being the graph that you want to show them first. This is this is has some serious benefits over showing them before you show them bar graphs that represent the the average, because that that what that kind of a graph does is it conceals the the true nature of the variation. And so this this can be you know greatly beneficial to your students um, in their in their understanding of this you know really how does science work and why do we collect data in the first place? So now uh, I'm going to copy this image with the camera that's in the upper right. Copy done, and I'm going to go back to the document and um, I'm going to I'm going to paste my graph in right here. And so I can see like that now uh, as a student, I have added this graph right in as my answer for number one, which asked me to make a graph. And now, you know, we look at questions number two and three. Number two, how does the average value of number of oxygen bubbles change as the distance of the Elodia plant from the light source increases? Look at the graph above you made for specifics to use in the answer. And, you know, this is where a student might say at 10 centimeters, the average was about 11 bubbles in a two minute period. And it, it, the number of bubbles decreased as we moved the light source away from the plant. And when we reached 50 centimeters away, it was about three bubbles on average produced in a two minute period. So these, these are the kinds of specifics that students can give you as evidence if they're, if they're looking at the, at the graph. Um, 
And then number three, now we're getting into some, some more deeper understanding. Why does the distance from the light source change the amount of oxygen bubbles observed? And this is where students are looking at that background knowledge about photosynthesis. They know that the energy for photosynthesis is, is, comes from light. And they can infer that as the light source moves further away, there's less energy available for photosynthesis. So photosynthesis slows down or some, something along those lines. By the way, I'm, I'm including an answer key in these materials. Uh, if at any time you want to request an answer key, just drop us an email at, at uh, info at dataclassroom.com and we will share an answer key with a teacher. We don't put those uh, publicly available on the web for uh, obvious reasons. Um, number four, uh, the number of bubbles produced in this experiment were, were the dependent variable that we measured by counting and indicate that photosynthesis is occurring. Based on what you know about photosynthesis, which products is the plant uh, producing during the time the bubbles were observed? Well, for this, the, the, what the answer you were looking for from a student is, well, we infer that oxygen is being produced since that is one of the outputs of photosynthesis. And we think that's what we're directly observing with the bubbles. And also uh, we can infer that glucose is being produced as oxygen is being released uh, because this is what, what photosynthesis does. And then finally, based on what you observed in this experiment and what you know about photosynthesis, what would you expect to happen to a plant that was kept in the dark for a long period of time, several weeks? Uh, why? So for this, you might get students say something like, it would be bad for the plant. Um, this is sort of the most general response. Uh, you know, As you move to a better answer, students might say something like, we would expect the plant to die after a prolonged uh, time period with no sunlight because it wouldn't be able to undergo photosynthesis and it wouldn't be able to produce glucose as its food source. So essentially the plant would run out of food uh, and that that would be bad for the plant and would probably result in death eventually. So this, this is the kind of answer and kind of thinking that you're looking for from a student there. So with that, I'll go back to, to the data set. Um, I also want to show you that, you know, some other graphs you might be able to, to make with this, right? So if we were to add, let's say, a student lab group onto this plot. So I click show for student lab group and you see it queued up here um, on the right and it's grayed out because it's not currently showing, but I could do something like uh, add it as my Z variable. And then you can see, um, you know, which student lab group collected each of these data points. And some of these data points are stacked on top of one another. And if, if we click this uh, group group by Z, it will it will spread those out and actually give us the descriptive uh, stats for for each combination of of treatment and lab group. But that's that's probably actually not what we want to do here. But just to show you how you can add uh, additional variables uh, on the plot to to see those um, in that, you could also connect connect the dots by lab group. So now it will show you uh, the series of data for each individual lab group uh, with their with their own uh, line connecting those those points. So this would you know could be useful if you wanted to compare these these series there. But I'm I'm gonna actually make connect the dots go away and um, we will make the student lab group go away by unclicking down here and go back to our original graph. So uh, that's the data set. That is the activity. That's how your students will work through it. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, you can reach us at info at dataclassroom.com. We are waiting for your questions, so please send them our way, and we're, we're glad to help. And with that, um, I will say good luck with this activity uh, and have fun implementing this with your students.